record here. Shane, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with well, you. Today. It's good to have you. I've, 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 I've always watched uh, your company from, uh, from afar, just keeping an eye on it, uh, Ediometry. Um, Shane, tell us a little bit about the company so that anybody who's not familiar with it can sort of get a, a, a bird's eye view of, of the company and sort of what its immediate goals are. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so we're really focused on driving efficiency and care by really unlocking the full potential of all of the patient data that is out there. Uh, we focus primarily on the ICU right now. Um, and what we're really focused on is driving efficiency and care, streamlining decision making. And we do that and improving outcomes, of course, um, with our clinical decision support platform that we have. So we have an FDA cleared clinical decision support software platform for the ICU. Um, and that aggregates data from multiple sources, pulls it into one visualization, gives you the full context of the patient, all of the longitudinal trends for that patient going back a couple of weeks or as long as those inputs have been coming into the system. And then on top of that, we have developed two proprietary risk algorithms that are FDA cleared as well for the pediatric population. So we show that on one visualization to really help guide decision making for patients uh, in the critical care environment, which is an incredibly complex environment um, where speed matters, uh, the right information matters, really guiding that decisions for, for those key, uh, key clinicians in the critical care environment. Yeah, so, so just for everybody, like ICU means intensive care yeah. unit. And, Absolutely. you know, if you've, if you've been in a hospital, which I always, you know, you know as much as I love them, I hate them, um, <laughs> you know, the, the beeps and the boops will drive you nuts. Um, you know, if you only had one thing beeping and booping, that might be one thing, but, you know, there can be five, 10 different things beeping and booping, which at some point you become, I think, desensitized to. Um, yeah. And, you know, I would assume based on longitudinal data and the way the system tracks it, it can sort of almost like your car with a warning light ahead of time tell you that something is going wrong um, that you may want to take a look at. Can, can you walk us through sort of, you know, a typical example maybe? Yeah, I, I, and I think what, what you're saying is right on target because it, it is, the ICU is an incredibly complex environment with numerous data sources. Um, there are numerous instances of data overload. There's just so much data out there that it's almost too much to, to comp comprehend and process for your patient. Um, you know, frankly, there are clinical studies out there talking about clinician burnout syndrome, where there's just so much to do, so many patients to manage. Uh, it's very in-depth and, and so many data sources to, to constantly uh, uh, take a look at that pulling it all together and then streamlining those decisions there, there's a real there's a real basis for that and a real market for that and that's what we're focused on doing um so for, for instance a, a good example is you know when you walk into a patient room in the icu you see a patient monitor you see numerous other devices and, and they all have readouts on them and in, in, in a display um what we do is essentially pull that into one visualization, which oftentimes at our sites sits right by the bedside. Um, so that can, uh, clinicians can look at that, they can, they can impact the system and look back over the course of a couple of weeks, uh, really dig into key parameters and, and see the interplay from things such as lab results that are coming into our system in context with the vital signs and our algorithms that are on our system as well. So, Instead of looking at all these different TikTok, I mean, I, I think about this. I mean, you know, the analogy that I would think of is like in a in a big 747, there's a lot of dials, right? Mm -hmm. But but the pilots are trained to sort of look at some very specific things. And now yeah. with the you know autopilots and everything else that are in there, it sort of made it easier to manage this. And a plane is not a simple you know, device by any stretch of the imagination. Um, how, are, how are the physicians utilizing this technology? And is it is it making it easier? 
uh, to sort of identify this. Because if you think about like the financial world, you can look at incredibly complicated sure. data that we figured out how to present to people visually that makes it much easier to understand how things are going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, there are a number of use cases of the technology that, that are utilized on a daily basis in our sites. Um, one common one, frankly, is rounding, daily rounding for the patients on every shift for the clinicians to get together, discuss what's going on with the patient, with, with the current situation, the diagnosis, how they're trending. Um, having, that, having that all in, in one platform um, and to be able to look at all of that data in context with one another really helps to drive those decisions. There are clinical studies pointing towards uh, up to nine decisions are made per patient on rounding. So again, having all of that information at your fingertips, um, that is a very common use case. Um, event reviews. So if a patient has a cardiac arrest and you want to look back and look at the history of that patient uh, or, or other types of events that happen, uh, it's great to, to be able to look at all of those longitudinal trending to make to, to really assess the, uh, what, what happened in that situation. Um, and then frankly, we have a web-based platform. So you can access it. Uh, if you're a physician at your desk in the hospital, you can ask, ask, access it at home or you can access it right by the bedside, uh, whether that's on an iPad or on a dedicated screen. So uh, oftentimes the use case is doctors and nurses will confer around the patient at the bedside by looking at the trends for that particular patient. Uh, and then for instance, our algorithms that sit right on the top of our visualization in the pediatric uh, world, um, they are essentially calling a, 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 an early warning sign to bring more attention to a patient. So as that is trending higher, that is, that is a sign for, hey, let's pay attention to this patient, dig in, find out what's going on, and then you can impact that with an intervention. Well, that was going to be my next you know, set of questions, which is you know, once you have enough data from enough patients, especially you know, being treated in a particular way, you can start to see that one intervention has a better outcome than another intervention um, or be able to actually highlight something is happening that needs attention before the event actually happens. And so, you know, when one of the examples I give you when I was interviewing the CEO of the Aura Ring, his comment was, is you could see or measure physiological changes three, four, maybe even up to five days before the patient actually feels that there's a problem. And I, and I think about it, like if you're developing a temperature, you don't feel the first few, you know, upticks. Right, it's got to get to a certain point where your body says, "Uh oh, I'm not feeling well." Um, right, and so I would assume that the systems that you guys have can, with enough data and with a you know putting together the right analytics, you could start to see these trends come up before they actually become a problem. So yeah, and it, it, I, I think that there's a, there are a few different ways to look at that. Um, the data that, that goes through our system is, is stored at the hospital level and the hospital has access to that. And we, we can help them with that um, from a quality improvement perspective of assessing all of that data. Um, we have a data science team on, on our on R&D our team um, who, who, helps, who helps hospitals with that quality improvement aspect. But then you also have the aspect of Every patient is such, it's, it's such a heterogeneous patient population within the ICU. So of course there may be trends across them that you can look at uh, most, most, most often retrospectively to, to assess yep. that data. Um, but the power of what we do is we're actually pulling in that data every five seconds into our system. So you can essentially do it in near real time at the bedside for that particular patient right now. It, it is a uh, essentially personalized medicine where, where you're looking at that patient, uh, comparing that patient to themselves and the trends that have been happening over the course of the last couple of hours or couple of weeks. Uh, and you can really see when, when something may be um, out, of the, out of the ordinary, if you will, and, and come in and intervene. So there, there are a few different ways to look at it from a, from a full retrospective, uh, almost a, a machine learning type of approach where you're looking at right. all, all this data uh, and looking at different patterns and outcomes, 
but then there's the model-based approach that we do that actually helps clinicians in near real time right at the bedside. And so, I mean, could you walk us through an example of how that would take place to give somebody, you know, the people listening, something real to sort of have in their mind? Sure, sure. So we, we have a number of, of case studies um, that, that I could point to. So, so for instance, uh, a patient comes out of cardiac surgery and they're in the ICU um, and you start to see our, our algorithm for uh, uh, essentially hypoxia. It's called inadequate delivery of oxygen. This is an FDA cleared algorithm. It was the first one that we had FDA cleared going back a few years um, and when that is trending red, that is the, the increasing probability that a patient has a mixed venous oxygenation below a certain level. So when a clinician looks at that and sees that that has been trending red and trending red for some time, what their first action is, is really to bring more attention to that patient, bring the doctors and nurses next, next to the bedside look at all of the various trends for the patient, look at what may be um, out of a normal range that they could perhaps intervene on. So for instance, they may look at the al algorithm and say, oh, okay, the, the, the blood pressure is really low for this particular patient. So we have a few different options that we could, we could intervene on. We could give the patient intravenous fluids, we could give the patient a vasopressor, uh, et cetera, to, to impact those, those metrics and get them back online. So that's a, that's a very common use. And, and what it's often called is, is escalation of care. As you see the algorithm trending in a particular direction, you are escalating care with the care team to make sure that that patient gets back on track. And so uh, my assumption is being able to get ahead of this or being able to manage this better mm -hmm. theoretically should have two impacts, right? One is somebody recovering faster or spending less time in an ICU and then therefore a decrease in cost. I mean, those, you know, money ball medicine is all about trying to achieve those two outcomes um, in my mind. So is that, are you guys seeing that happen with, uh, with your platform? We are, we are. We have, we have evidence, uh, clinical evidence showing reduction in length of stay. Um, and we have clinical evidence showing reduction in cost per patient as well. Um, there's also some studies that, should, that point towards uh, reduction in readmission back to the ICU. So if you're in the ICU for an extended period of time and leave to go to a step-down unit or general care ward, um, oftentimes those patients go back to the ICU. So we've seen a, a pretty substantial decrease in, in readmissions back to the ICU in some of our clinical studies. So. Uh, we continue to drive evidence. That's one of the things that I'm most proud about uh, the company is the, the level of evidence that, that we're able to drive. And that's, frankly, that's, that's a key part of our system, being that it's software, um, being that the hospitals that we are involved with, we are collecting that data at the hospital level that they have access to, that they can mine through to drive that clinical evidence. So, um, and frankly, that the ability to collect that data for the hospital um, also points towards other potential utilizations of the technology as we move forward. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking like if you've got all this data on all these different mm -hmm. patients, you, you, you can almost create simulations. Mm -hmm. uh, understanding, yeah. you know, basically based on how other patients have reacted to either a medication or an intervention, what typically happens next. Um, I mean, on one hand, you could almost help people move towards a more efficacious intervention. But on the other hand, I think for a simulation on training, that would also be a, a, a big step up. Uh, having the system react to what would probably happen in a, in a real patient. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a really good point. And that, that is certainly something that, that we have uh, given the data that we have access to, um, we, we of course get de-identified data. We don't do anything with, with PHI, but um, you know the hospitals collect the data at their at their level, and we get the de-identified data for future algorithm development, et cetera, uh, as we continue to to work on new algorithms. So our data science team works on that data um, and and looks at that 
and, and from a, from a perspective of looking at key trends um, and and looking at exactly what you're, what you're talking about here. You know, are there key trends that we can help hospitals point towards? Uh, we automate reports for hospitals as well based on quality improvement initiatives. So um, yeah, it's it's a big part of what we're up what we're about. It's again, it's it's really getting back to unlocking the full potential of patient data. You know, it's, it's, That's interesting. So I should I should introduce you to uh, another you know uh, CEO I spoke to uh, Charles Fisher from Unlearn AI, where they're they're creating a digital twin mm-hmm. for clinical trials, right? So there might be some synergies that yeah. that you guys yeah. can take advantage of because they're trying to create the digital twin, and you have actually the patterns that a patient would go through that might yeah, make we, that digital twin more real. Yeah, and that, that's frankly, that's language that we use internally as well, as digital twin. You know, given that what, what separates us from a lot of companies out there and the way that they do data and analytics is we've built a model of human physiology. So we have taken all of this data that we've collected, all of the clinical literature that we have mined through, uh, and essentially looked at all of the various functions in the body, cardiovascular mechanics, pulmonary mechanics, autonomic regulation, acid-base balance, and essentially translated that to differential equations. So we have built a model, a mathematical model of human physiology that we essentially, based on the data coming into our system, is constantly updating to show what, what and compare it to that patient in the bed. So that's that's very similar, frankly, the, the digital twin. I'm glad to hear that others others using that because I think it's an important element of what we do. Well, that, you know, it's, it's also something the FDA is interested in is, mm-hmm. you know, can we create a digital twin um to help trials go forward because sometimes you can't get as many people as you like into a trial but if you had a digital twin that might serve as as a a proxy for uh, a real patient um you know how many i i want to ask something like you know how many patients do you have like that you've monitored and try to get an idea of like how how because at some point you get to a big enough data set yeah. that you really can simulate things much with, with much more clarity than sure. in, in other situations. Yeah, I, I think the best way I could characterize it is, is we have hundreds of millions, or, or, or I should say millions of hours of collected physiology data, uh, human physiology data. So, um, we are, we are constantly seeking out more and more information around that data. So you know, diagnosis information, uh, medication information, et cetera. That's, that's always what we're, what we're working uh, on, on doing more of so we can have more a, a richer data set to be able to do some of the analysis that you're speaking of. But, um, but yeah, that, that's, we, we, have, we have quite a bit at our disposal that, that we continue to work through internally for, for algorithm development. So your main customer is, is our hospitals. Yes. Okay. And so, but that data set you've got is, is got to have, you know, data is data. I always tell people like the model is not just, you know, very singular and I sell a widget to, <laughs> to someone and they use the widget data is, has a lot more uses and can be, you know, manipulated and, or, uh, have value to a lot of other stakeholders. So are there other groups that would you think would, would be able to extract value from what you've created? Yeah, we, and we're really assessing that now. You know, as I came into the company uh, coming up on a year ago, um, one, one of the key goals was really to, to, there's been so much fantastic technical and clinical work done over the last number of years. and and really my goal was to build out the commercialization function for the company. So to continue to drive to uh, grow the company um, on an annual basis, get into and engage with more hospitals, help more patients, help more, help more clinicians throughout all of this. Uh, but right now what we are doing is, is assessing just that, which what you mentioned is, what are some of the other areas that, that could benefit from this data? Um, anecdotally, I think there, that there is an angle with, with pharma and with clinical trials around 
automatically collecting data and potentially impacting, um, you know, some of the some of the potential patient selection. Um, you could even look at um, uh, speed to inclusion or exclusion. These are just these are these are all just hypotheses that that we have as we're assessing uh, different markets that 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 could be. Uh, uh, that we could enter into with with our technology, uh, but for the most part, what we are focused on, and, and it, I think it's important for all startups to to have that that intense focus, um, is on the ICU right now. Um, there is no doubt that that the the potential for this technology in the operating room, in the emergency department, and in other care settings throughout the hospital. That's our long-term vision to essentially be that hospital safety net with our algorithms, with our data, uh, with streamlining the care and driving efficiency. Um, but right now, it's it's primarily with the with the ICU. That's well. That was going to be a, one of my other questions: is when you're, you know, put this into a a ICU, do you get that aha moment from people going? damn, I wish I had this before. Like this would have made my life a whole lot easier. And oh, by the way, can we use this over here? Because we could also use a monitoring system or a early warning platform over in this area. Th that that tends to happen quite frequently, to be honest. Yeah, so the for sure, getting the system in and seeing the visualization where you're pulling all of this information together um, it, it's 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 kind of that immediate benefit that immediate aha to the efficiency and the workload that you have as a clinician it's it's all right here in one place um, and then of course with the algorithms on top of that as an early warning sign um, and to bring more attention to that 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 patient that that's that's been really vital aha moments for them so we have seen, and that's that's a key part of our growth this year as a company, is moving to other other departments, other ICUs within the same hospital. That's a cornerstone of our of our commercial strategy, um, and and that's that's certainly taken place this year. So, have you seen it? Um, you know, getting a physician to do something different is not always a trivial exercise, um, <laughs> but hopefully, data. Um, you know, sways someone's decision making. Have you have you guys been able to sort of objectively measure uh, a a shift over time of how people might manage a patient based on the data that comes from the system? Yeah, I, I think it's it's I think it's probably anecdotal measurement right now, just based on feedback from customers. I, I, I'm very interested in driving adoption and assessing adoption on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So that's, that's definitely an undertaking that we are digging into with our customers to get more insight into that. Um, but there's no doubt about it. Anytime you're changing someone's behavior, I mean, we're, we're all consumers, you know, think right. of yourself as you get a, get a new cell phone or something. Uh, sometimes it takes a, a bit to get into um, to get into the flow with that. Uh, it's the same thing with with clinicians. What we what we focus on and pride ourselves on is is reducing workload and driving efficiency. So if you can show someone how you are taking time out of something that might take <clears throat> excuse me might have taken them longer before, um, that's usually the the path to driving adoption sooner. And, and when you can show them how easy to use it is, um, that, that's been our path. So having the web-based platform as well and being able to access that anywhere, especially this year of all years, this, this strangest of right. years that we are in, <laughs> uh, the, you know, having a remote platform where you can access it away from the bedside or at home, um, that, that's been really important. And that, that's really driven a lot of adoption. Of, of our system. Well, that was going to be, I guess, you know, one of my next questions is COVID has caused, you know, a big shift in, I think, adoption of technologies in a, in a way that we had, had we planned this out, I think I would have said, ah, some of this will take another five to 10 years. Um, and COVID has sort of pulled everything closer, faster. Uh, how, how have you seen it affect what you guys are doing? I, I think the 
Of course, it's been a challenge for a lot of hospitals during this time, especially in the early days. Everybody was, was the clinicians were so overwhelmed with the influx of patients. Uh, I remember chatting with clinicians that, that I've known for years and they, they, they were telling me, well, we, we spend most of our time running around looking for PPE in the <laughs> early days, which was just Jesus. pretty crazy, obviously. Um, I think that hospitals are much better suited now, just given that we've been through that initial initial days. It's, it's for sure, it's still a challenge. Uh, hospitals are still still having challenges with that. But the way it's affected us as a company, uh, we reached out to all of our customers and essentially worked with them to g- get our software wherever they needed it. Um, you know, given the fact that it is remote, given the fact that you can you can hopefully and potentially limit the viral exposure to clinicians by being able to remotely look at the patient and, and all of the key parameters and, and at times not, not need to be by the bedside. Um, that was really what we have spoken to customers about. Um, I think you've seen many companies out there talk about how it's been a challenging year, medical device companies and otherwise just given the Lack of elective procedures, hospitals' budgets are, are they're, they're worried about budgets, of course. Right. So I think that's affected every company out there. Um, we have been able to, and we're, we're really proud of this, um, help more and more hospitals and patients this year than ever before. Um, and, right. and that's partly due to COVID, for sure. Just just given that, I think if, if COVID has shown anything, it's shown that if you can be efficient in your care, there's a huge plus for that. Um, and ICU care is, is, is a challenge to drive efficiency, and especially when you have this influx of patients. So anything that can make things faster and uh, impact decision-making quicker, which is where we live with our technology, there's, there, that's, there's always going to be a, a positive for that. Well, and I, I do believe like, you know, if there's more adoption, it means there's more data coming in, which means analytics get better. I mean, d- data has a way of, of getting, you know, giving you more and more to play with um, mm-hmm. all the time. So it just gets richer and richer in its ability to, to tease out um, interesting you know, trends or identify like what works over what doesn't work. Sure. Agreed. Yeah. So what's, what, what do you see next for the company? So we, we are, are right now really focusing on some key uh, technical advances of, of the platform. Um, we have a, a couple of key things with our algorithms that will, when they're, when they're launched, provide more insight, not just about what is happening with the algorithm, but why why an algorithm is elevated, which can hopefully inter, uh, 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 impact the interventions that take place with the, with the clinicians. So again, we, we really focus on going deeper and deeper into the why, not just what may happen, but why is, what is, ha- why is the patient in the condition that they're in right now? What can you, what can you hopefully do about it by, by assessing that information? So we're really excited about those. Um, we are really pushing forward on a number of clinical studies as well which uh, continuing to advance the science in this space and and around using data uh, most effectively is is really what we're all about. And then of course, growth. We we are are really in our growth phase, um, interacting with more and more hospitals on a daily basis. Um, That's really what we're focused on for for the the short term. Well, if you you actually know why, which would be, you know, just from a human physiology and understanding the mechanism of action. Um, you can much clearer figure out what to do next. And then you can actually measure when you do something next, like which one gives you the best outcome. I mean, it's, so I just look at this as a, you know, giant figure eight loop, feedback right? loop, right? That, <laughs> that just gets better over time. Yeah. Um, you yeah. just have to have the data sciences, you know, that can sit there and, and crunch through all this data. Yeah, it, it agreed. And that's that's really what we're focused on. That's where the name of the company comes from, etiometry. We're, we're looking at the etiologies. We're trying to figure out the etiologies of, of what is causing a particular condition uh, to better inform 
the, the decision making around the intervention on the other side. So. Awesome. Well, it was great to talk to you today. I, I know yeah, we're, you know, we're, you. we're COVID secluded, but uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully, you know, by next summer, we'll, you know, start to get back to normal. Yeah, let, let's hope. Uh, let, let's hope we get it under under control here pretty soon. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for having me on and uh, look forward to chatting with you again soon, hopefully. Yeah, and I, I hopefully one of these days we'll meet in person. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Take care.